we doing here? We're making Bloody Marys. I think. This kind of seals the deal. Ah, There's local, no way around it. Yeah. Former local company. I couldn't find Mr. and Mrs. T. Spicy. This is looking a little lopsided. Smaller glass. This will look good. This is your first time making a Bloody Mary? No, I've made them before. Much more proportionate. It's less farmhouse. More manly. Yeah. <clears throat> manly. Oh. Dude. More of those rabbit pellet. Here's where it gets really manly. The Slim Jim. Ah. What I'm talking about, brother. Snap in. Jeez, that looks stupid. This looks pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Right? Yeah. I mean, shit, how hard is it to make a Bloody Mary? All right, cheers. Cheers, cheers. cheers. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having us in your kitchen. Sure. And what are you making today? I'm making a quiche. What's the deal? What's the story behind well, the quiche? Well, it's like the first dish, it is the first dish that I ever made for my girlfriend at the time, now wife. And I didn't know how to cook anything really. So I called my mom. Mom, what should I make for Corden? She said, quiche. So I made a Corden quiche. Colette, my mom's name is Colette's quiche. That's what I call it. Because I don't really make quiches. I make frittatas right. once in a while because you don't need to have that crust. But everything's better with crust. Yeah, I'm not arguing that. It's just more like two in the morning. Right. What's in the fridge? Sure. Eggs, usually. Quick, yeah. Where's that from? Frittata. Italian. So quiche, think French, right? Quiche Lorraine. Yeah. Quiche Lorraine. Yeah. It started in Germany. I looked it up. Well, what was the French stole it? What was the original quiche? Uh, it's just simple. Whatever, whatever you have. Egg, like that's, cheese. Yeah. I think that's the nice thing about quiche is you can throw anything. <laughs> so what's going in your quiche? We've got some bacon. Some white onion, a little bit of broccoli, and of course, lots of cheese, milk, and eggs. You poking pre, some holes in pre poke it. The key to a good crust is having it crunchy, not soggy, right? Okay. So I'm gonna just pre cook this. I'll remember the word later, and then we'll fill it with stuff. And were you yeah. making this for your girlfriend slash wife for breakfast, or was this a this dinner thing? This is a thing? dinner dish. Yeah. This was a dinner dish. But it could be breakfast the next morning. Sure, and Don't that was your plan. <laughs> You were strategizing. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You're like, how can I max out my dollar? You don't have to leave the house. It's all here. Breakfast, dinner. And did it doesn't you, cost a lot. Did you have it for breakfast with her? I would, I would say yes. I don't okay. remember. It was, it was a, a good quiche. Yeah. A little, little pieces. Okay. All right, so we're chopping some onion. Yeah. Keep in mind, I have no technique. Okay. I was a sous chef for a few minutes back in the 80s. But Your first cooking gig was where, when? Well, it's a funny story. McDonald's. McDonald's. My, friend, my friend and I were skating in the strip mall, and we went in, and the manager was super hot. So we're like, let's apply for a job, see if we can meet her. <laughs> this is like we a had movie. mohawks, and for some reason, she hired us. And it was absolutely miserable. I think it was like three bucks an hour back then. I probably lasted a month, maybe. My mom has pictures of me like behind the counter with my little hat on and so angry. And on the back of it, she wrote, angry. Angry. Like, well, yeah, that'll do it. But it was near a famous uh, <clears throat> resort out in the desert called Two Bunch Palms. Al Capone's old vault, supposedly. So famous people go there. So I remember Tommy Lee and Heather Locklear coming into McDonald's. So, Cause it was right around the corner. So I somehow I ended up working there next as a busboy, and then a uh, sous chef. They wanted this big German guy wanted me. So basically I just washed lettuce. And obviously didn't do this, but it's not very good at it. Okay. But that was filled with celebrities too. And what, what I learned is celebrities are very cheap. They didn't even tip. But they lay out by the pool, often with no clothes on. It was an interesting place. So I was gonna ask you, because yeah, yeah. you have culinary expertise, okay. what's, how do you, what's the best way to do the garlic without smelling garlic on your fingers? for like three days. That's that's probably unavoidable. That's unavoidable. Okay, so here's what you do. Cut. Take your knife, smash it, take that peel off. Get some cheese going. Okay. Now, if you'll notice over here on the right, there's a rule we have in this house. You gotta pay the cheese tax. <laughs> Look at these guys. <laughs> the, the cheese, cheese tax. tax. The cheese, so you go like this. 
sure the wife's not around. But... Oh my god. The cheese stuff. The cheese stuff. You're making it rain. Then they'll do that for a while. And to get the floor cleaner. Have you ever made this quiche for the band? No. Do no, they even know that you can do this? I don't think anyone in the world knows, but my wife and you, when you asked me what's the first dish that you remember making, I think, is this is it. So this is where we are. Okay. Um, no, with the band, you're always moving around. You're eating out everywhere, you know? Yeah, yeah. And when you guys are eating out, what are you eating? What are we talking about? The way it works, usually at a club or theater, when you do a concert, they either make you dinner or it's what's called a buyout. They got to pay the band a certain amount of money. It used to be five bucks, that's like 20 bucks for each person to go have dinner. In the... Around town or in the venue, most places, they want you to eat there. They'll get, well, eat our food. Or we say, you know, how about we give us money and we'll go down the street and find somewhere to hang out and eat, relax before the show, so. And then everything else is traveling, so you're stopping. If it's in Germany, you're eating at gas stations all day on the Autobahn. If it's, okay. If it's in America, you're going to wear a craft bear on the Waffle House, right? So okay. Every day is different, but typically a diner is the key because it's something for everyone, any time of day. Can you eat before a show, before you go on, or do you? It's a horrible idea. Sometimes you have to if you're like starving, but like we just played in Salt Lake City and we went to this famous uh, Mexican joint around the corner. <laughs> that already sounds bad. Mole plays red something, <laughs> yeah. And the whole show, we were all just like, <laughs> it's a horrible idea. You can do Why did I do that? But it's hard because you're playing late at night. You gotta, you gotta time yourself. Eat a couple hours before. Do you end up like eating like once a day when you're on tour? Yeah, a lot, often, yeah. Or sometimes all day. When all all day. Is, all you're doing is traveling for eight hours. You know, boredom. It okay. gets dangerous. So when you're in Europe, what's the country that you can't wait to go to because you love the food the most? Uh, well, Italy, obviously, yeah, Italy. Cause just because the way they eat, it's like it's the best. A it's 17 course every meal, you know. And you're talking about gas stations? I think I had like one of the best pasta yeah. at a gas station in Venice. Yep, they do. They have uh, like the pasta buffet at a gas station. Yeah. Well, over in Europe, it's, they like take pride in like, we're going to cook you our food, you know, so you, you eat some crazy dishes like in Croatia, like you don't even know what it is. Or olive oil, why not? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, that smells good. Smell so that with the bacon. I'll probably do this with the broccoli just a little bit. So Should I bring the broccoli over? Yeah. Drop it in? They say olive oil is good for you, so this is yep. my new deal. I'm going to bring garlic. It's time for an egg party. All right, so let's go back to the beginning of your music career. Unsound? Unsound, first band. Summer out of high school, Palm Springs, California. Went to a Dickies concert at Oasis Water Park, and there was these older kids, spiked hair and mohawks, and I knew they were in a band. It was called Scabies Babies. What's their band? But they didn't have a singer, they just jammed punk rock. So I went up and said, hey guys, I'm new here. I've been in a bunch of punk bands. I'm a good singer, you gotta let me try. This made up a story in my mind, and they said, all right, be here at this, at this time and place. I went home, I'm begging my dad to go down to Radio Shack and buy me a $100 PA, like this really crappy little PA thing. They must have speakers. And a Radio Shack microphone, you can imagine how mm. good that sounded. Took the bus from Desert Hot Springs to Cathedral City, California. It took quite two hours. Went in and just went for it. One, two, three, four. We jammed out and the band started, we probably played a party two weeks later. Like, it just happened really quick. Those guys are a little older, but out in the desert, there was no such thing as a rock club or a rock venue, so you've probably seen, heard the stories about generator parties out there. They've become famous since then, but back then, that was just a necessity. There was nowhere to play. Even if we practiced, like in a garage, cops would show up. So we started even practicing outside at the Nude Bowl, a place called Devil's Canyon, all these places just out in the middle of the desert with a generator. And then that practice would turn into party. Everyone, you could see with binoculars. I don't even, 
know how it was possible with before social media. All everybody would have was a dial-up phone, you know. But all of a sudden, 500 kids would be out in the middle of middle of the desert, like a what's it, Lord of the Flies, just going crazy. And we were often the soundtrack of that, and a band called Caius, Fatso Jetson, Yawning Man, Solar Feast, a million bands. Mm -hmm. um, but that was it. We probably only lasted about four years, but one of the things that came out of that is Caius became a bunch of bands, but one of them being Queens of the Stone Age, one of the biggest rock bands. So, But Caius got a cult, cult following, especially over in Europe. In the 10 years, I had moved here in 94 after we broke up on sound, we're like, we're done. So I really didn't know about it, but it became like a big thing, and those people still tour the world to this day, right? Yeah. I came down here and started a band, uh, Furious Four. Because mm -hmm. I got bored after about, I started going to San Diego State and I needed another outlet. Started Furious 4 and played here locally, Casbah, places like that. We almost made it, we almost made it. Really? I had to do the Warp Tour and had record companies come down and all that, but we kind of fizzled out. And Nick Oliveri, who was in Caius, uh, and then Queens of the Stone Age, and the Dwarfs. Mm -hmm. I went down to the Casbah one night, the Dwarfs were playing. I remember it, because the next day was the 4th of July. And uh, we hung out, caught up, hadn't seen him in 10 years. Next day he calls and says, hey, you want to go to Europe play guitar for six weeks? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, you got to learn these 35 songs we're leaving like in a week. So I just buckled down. It's kind of more metal than I was used to than the pop punk kind of thing Furious 4 was doing. But I learned them and probably spent about eight, nine years touring the world with Nick. That was great. My first time to Europe, the kid in the candy store, you know, South America, Australia. It was a lot of fun. He's a great guy. He kind of toured too much for me and I started having kids and I started my own business. Mm -hmm. I had to start my own business because whenever I tour, you can't keep a job, right? So I started my own custom furniture and cabinet shop 20 years ago now. So I could leave in the summers or, you know, when I needed to go on tour. Perfect. Yeah, so it, it did work out. After Mono Generator, this band came into the picture. <laughs> which was my favorite band as a kid in junior high school. My nickname was Ian Amoeba. <laughs> Probably because I just sang that song everywhere I went. So Flash, I don't even know, 30 years later, one night in this garage right here, I was, uh, me and my wife just bought this house. We were celebrating, drinking in the garage. And I sent a message to Tony. I had befriended Tony, the singer of Bad Lessons, from the Furious Four days, right? And uh, just asking about something, and at the end I signed up. By the way, if you ever need a guitar player, ha ha ha. I hit sin, I'm like, oh. <laughs> I just fucking made that weird, didn't I? <laughs> about 10 minutes later, bing! I didn't know you were available. Uh, so I'm like, this sounds very interesting. Steve Soto will be calling you in a minute. I'm like, Steve Soto is gonna call me? And sure enough, Steve Soto calls. Hey bud, Tony tells me you wanna play the Pokes. First show is in like a month with GBH at the Fonda. And I'm just like, okay, I hung up. Dang. I started laughing and then I started crying. I'm like, what did I just do? I, I, I didn't mean for that to happen, but, or did I? You know, so, mm. but I had to go try out. And so obviously I know all the, we all have the, the original songs in our DNA from the Blue record, right? But they've done, did six records since. So I had to learn those. And I drove up to practice, but the singer wasn't there. And so we're playing. And you can imagine trying to play a song without the singer, you're like, sure. So I was just choking. I left, drove home, I'm like, oh, I shit the bed on that one, that's not. And Steve Soto called again and said, hey buddy, can you come up and try that again tomorrow? I was like, try yes. Try again? What did he mean by that? Try, come try like, it again. In other words, go do your homework. Like, you must have saw something in me. Because I you, sucked. Do, okay, so the homework of like learning some songs, that they have like, here's the set list that we usually play, here yeah. are the songs to learn. Yeah. Okay. They said 30 songs and learn these. 30 songs. Yeah, yeah something like that. That was a lot. Oh, yeah. And so, like I said, the 10 songs off this, I could play without even thinking. But all the stuff I had never heard in the mm -hmm. 10 years, you know, the last records. And without the vocal cues, I was just choking. So, you know, you do it all by ear. Just basically listening to, I think, on Spotify or YouTube. Okay, just going yeah. like this, trying to learn the parts, picking which parts are yours. Which are the other guitar player? Uh, and I usually picked those opposites, so I went up there with him. Nope. Anyways, I ditched work the next day and practice all day, drove up, and they're like, all right, you're in. That was 10 years ago. So Ian Amoeba is now playing Amoeba. 
adolescence is kind of like a circle. When you play with the adolescents, you're not just playing guitar, you're doing backup vocals. You got a big part yeah. on that stage. Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting that. And um, the last few records that I wrote on there, you know, okay. like, oh my God, I wrote adolescent songs. I'm not just playing the original songs. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Well, Steve Soto, rest in peace, our leader, our bass player who passed away. Jeez. Five years ago, I think it was just five years ago already. Mm -hmm. He was, a, his voice was in like seven angels. He could hit every harmony, super powerful. So he, he owned all that. And now with him missing, we really have to step up and do these harmonies. It's like, you go low, I'll go high and try and fill, fill the void, you know, as much as we can. I want to make some salad dressing. Forgot all that. <laughs> all right, here on, let's make some salad dressing. <laughs> This is what he makes a salad dressing in. Yeah, I think you're supposed to do more oil than vinegar, right? Yes. We need a little Italian seasoning, right? Okay. They don't have German seasoning? Uh, that's salt. Lots of it. What's German seasoning? Salt and Kolsch, beer. Kolsch beer? Yeah. Is it working? No. It's squeezing. I saw the juice come out. Like, if you tilt it on its side, it. It's there. What's happening? There it is. It smells like something. Yeah. And then what we have here is a little spring mix. Okay. In the fall. What about the jingles? You told me you wrote some jingles. That's right, yeah. For commercials? So in between some of the band stuff, you know, I was like, I, before kids, you're like, I have to play music all the time, right? But when yeah. you have the time. So I decided I'm gonna write jingles, I'm gonna write commercials. And this is before all the indie bands started giving their songs to Apple and all that free. Uh -huh. Back then it was like a huge business. I got bought a little home studio and taught myself Pro Tools and just got obsessed with it. I would submit them to different people. I finally got a guy in LA. Basically what they do is they send you, hey, we need a song for this company and it's gotta, back then, it's gotta sound like Green Day. <laughs> it's gotta sound like Green Day. I could do that all day long, right? So. Uh, I did, it's, I did several. I got a couple, I got a Coca-Cola and an Applebee's. It takes two, baby. There's a cover <laughs> of that song, Green Day style. I got, I got like 20 grand for 30 seconds of music that I didn't write. It pays stupid money. And uh, I almost, I don't know, almost, but I tried for the Office theme song. Mm. And they actually wrote back like, change this, change this. So I'm like, oh my God. Didn't even really know what it was at the time. And uh, and also the subway one. And now I didn't get either one. Now when I hear doo -doo 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 -doo, the office when it became I'm like that person made probably a hundred million dollars for that theme song. <laughs> I think Rocky knows that the quiche is ready. Can I open it, bud? Bowie. Alright. You know what? This looks so good I'm not even using the oven mitts. Yeah. That's, that is, that's a punk rock <laughs> quiche right there. Is Rocky approved? And it's Bowie approved. All right. You tell me with eggs, like with meat, I'm really bad at letting it rest. You gotta yeah. let it rest. Yeah. Yeah, and steaks. Steaks is huge to let yeah. it rest. You gotta let that thing rest for like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. See, that's hard for me. I'm like two minutes. I'm like, I'm going in. Yeah. All right. Eat some garnish. Eat your, eat your Bloody Mary garnish. How do you like, oh wait, we didn't even taste the, the rim of this. Oh yeah. So we have our fancy metal Woo! straws. Holy it's shit. It's already kind of spicy. I gotta pull back the weeds. That Slim Jim almost went up my nose. <laughs> <laughs> so you go back to the swap meet story. They were selling t-shirts at the swap meet, the San shirts. Diego yeah. Kobe swap meet. Black and white t-shirts, every shirt, minor thread, subhumans, you name it, the cramps. I had yeah. a cramp shirt I got from there. I got a, I mean, it was kind of cheesy, but I had a Sex Pistol shirt, Holiday in the Sun. Yeah. That was a cool shirt. Oh, I had that. But but the $5, $5 t-shirts, I definitely had my God Save the Queen shirt back in the day that wasn't licensed, right? Wasn't licensed. <laughs> but so, yeah. now that's, yeah, what I was going to say is like, you can't really support that anymore because now that music is supposed to be free, it's considered free. If you make music, Unless you're, you know, Taylor Swift or U2. Music is free on Spotify when you make a record. Luckily, vinyl has come back and we sell a lot of vinyl at our shows mm -hmm. to help us get to the next town and, what, and whatnot. But 
music is basically free. So t-shirts, merchandise is what bands need to make money now. You see a guy with a van with $5 bootleg shirts of every band, that guy should get beaten down, right? <laughs> he will. Let's go. Let's get, let's dig into this pie. You got a you got a pizza cutter for it? Well, I experiment. <laughs> pizza cutter. Now sing a jingle with the piece. It takes two. It takes two, baby. <laughs> There's two. But we're gonna go into probably four. This is how I'd probably end it with four. But then you're like, what's the matter with you, dude? Uh, see, that's what I don't want to happen. Is the crumble. Yeah, what do you do if you have five people in the band? Well, then how do you cut it? This one is for the two newest members right here. That... <laughs> is that how everything works? <laughs> Yes, you get the. All right. Look at that thing. And that's what I would have obviously done with my cording quiche. Fully. Get the perfect slice. Fully stocked quiche. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. This looks great. See. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see what he's all about. Mm -hmm. I'm good. That's good. I'm good. I was good. That is good. I don't like it when it's like full fluffy and dry. This is still a little loose. Like, if you got out, you should have crushed as you go. That's trick. Like, that's the bite right there. Boom. Yes, chef. That's what sells it. You can't just go all egg all the time. There you go. That's what you're saying. See what I'm saying? And. That's a good quiche. Tomorrow morning, I'll be here. Should you end up here in, in the morning, you never know. That is correct. Mm, this is really good. I'm really impressed. Really? Yeah. Absolutely. Because, like I said, I sort of feel like a frog being the one in here cooking in, in this kitchen. But good. I'll agree, that's good. Now I know why you got married. See? This sealed the deal. This is marrying quiche. Oh, yeah. Now, if your band members watch this, they're, oh, yeah, they're gonna, gonna be egging you. Oh! They'll be egging me on more than they already do. Oh! Cheese tax! <laughs> Alright, well. Well, thanks for coming over to my, my Thanks for kitchen. being a sport and doing this. Yeah. Now we know that you can write music and cook and build out kitchens. This, by the way, this is Ian did the whole build out here. Yeah, this, I designed and built this kitchen in the pandemic when they said you can't go to work. This is what we did. We moved the house out and built this. Mm -hmm. And then when he was talking about what his business, that's his business. Taylor Design and Build. If you ever need a kitchen, call me up. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. This is rad. Cheers. Thanks for having me. I guess I need another one. I think every time I eat a quiche from now on, I'm going to think of your quiche. I'm going to think of this. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Cheers. Man.